Welcome back, everyone. State Senator Kevin Whitcoast here with another edition of Veterans Corner. Today, my special guest is not only a, a member who served many, many years in our, our, our U.S. Armed Forces, but is a, a personal friend of mine. And I'm so pleased to welcome uh, Master Sergeant Mark Penny from the United States Air Force today. Mark, welcome. Good morning, Senator Whitcoast. You know, Mark and I, we go back, we work together on the, on the Canton Police Department, so we know each other from a personal level, too, but I, I want to applaud you for your service to your country, and I know we'll get into it, but um, my, my children actually had a picture of Mark on their bedroom wall when he was deployed overseas in one of the, uh, one of the, um, the theaters, or what do you call it, the uh, deployment, I guess, if you mm -hmm. will, uh, to protect our country. So, uh, Mark, you entered the... the uh, what, the National Guard or the, Air, the yeah. Army or the, the Air Force, Air Force. Uh, when you were 18 years old? Why don't right you tell after, us a little bit about that, right how you made that school. decision to decide to do it? Uh, right after high school, um, I was just trying to figure out what I wanted to do with, with my life. And you know when you're 18, it's, you just don't know exactly where you're going. You need a little bit of direction. And I really wanted to do some traveling. So I just came up with the idea to go talk to a military recruiter. Um, my dad had been in the Army, and uh, I knew a little bit about the Army. But while I was down waiting for the recruiters, the Army recruiter wasn't there, and the Air Force recruiter grabbed me and was <laughs> waiting out in the hallway, and we started talking. And uh, next thing you know, I was signing up to join the Air Force. Now, did you get to pick what you wanted to do when you met with the recruiter? Did you say, I, wanna, I think I want to do this, or I want to do that? How did that work? Well, you know those stories about recruiters trying to, or acting like car salesmen and, and selling you something? Right. That's true. Absolutely <laughs> true. Um, I actually talked one of my best friends into coming with me, too, Mike Fennessy. You've met him. Sure, yeah. Uh, so we went down to the recruiter on the day we were going to pick our jobs, and uh, they had this career field, Tactical Air Command Control Specialist, that the recruiter said, you're going to be up in a tower, controlling aircraft, and then you get to go to college at night, and that wasn't 100% accurate. No? So what did you end up doing? Well, at, when we went to basic training, we were all getting our assignments, and everybody had their, their jobs all set up. They got their little job packets, and uh, Mike and I, we went together. We, we didn't have ours there, and we asked, and one of the drill instructors said, oh, you're two of those special guys. Right away, we knew something was wrong. You felt special. We, well, we didn't really feel special, <laughs> but we knew something was going on. So what it was is a tactical air command control specialist are part of a, a special operations in the Air Force. So those are the guys that go out on the battlefields with the Army and control airstrikes. So there was no towers. There was no going to college. It was pretty much driving around in a tank. Uh, in, in Germany, that's where I spent four years, right after, uh, right after I left basic training and then went to tech school. So you, you went to, to boot camp, and how long was that? Which uh, every, that was, everybody that enters the military service has to go to some type of a boot camp, That's correct. correct. Uh, the Air Force's uh, uh, boot camp, so to speak, is at Lackland Air Force Base. Okay. I, I know they've changed the curriculum a little bit, but at that time it was six weeks there. And then from there, um, we went to Herbert Field in Florida, for, it was almost three months of advanced training, and that's where we learned how to use radio systems, control aircraft. Mm. Um, there was uh, survival techniques. You learned uh, basic infantry skills that the Army learns, but the Air Force, um, they don't really have the need for. Right. It's mostly um, technical skills that uh, you learn for that job is what you get at And from there you schools. were shipped to Germany? Um, you have what's called a dream sheet. And you could pick your assignments. and they call The American it, dream. They call it a dream sheet because you, you dream of getting these assignments, but you always go where the Air Force needs you best. And right. I was lucky to get one. I wanted to go to England or Germany, and uh, I ended up going to Germany, which was just fantastic. I'm very glad that I had that opportunity. And you stayed at a, a U.S. base in Germany? Uh, it was an Army. Was as an Air Force guy, um, I was assigned to ar an Army um, unit. Okay. So we traveled with the Army, slept, ate, pretty much lived the Army way of life as a, as a blue suitor, an Air Force guy. Um, and that was a very unique experience as well because then you, you got to do things most Air Force guys wouldn't do. Got to jump out of helicopters, drive tanks, um, 
it, it was just a really great experience. And what was the name of the base that you stayed in Germany, if you I, recall? Well, I was at uh, Warner Barracks. I think it's actually still there, but that was in okay. Bamberg, Germany. It's uh, in Bavaria. It's a little bit south of Munich. Everybody pretty much knows where Munich right. is, where the Oktoberfests are. Sure. So. Uh, got a little uh, day trip, maybe, when you were uh, over there? I went to four of those. Oh. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> you know, well, that's living the American dream in another country, if you Pretty will. much. S while still serving your own country. Pretty much. And it was a fantastic experience for, for a young adult just to experience that, the different cultures. Um, I was able to go to so many different countries that surround Germany as well, Spain. England, Austria, um, but one of the highlights from that is, uh, of course, I went in in 1984, so was, the Cold War was still in effect, but I actually got to travel to East Berlin in East Germany and see what communism really sure. was. Um, the wall came down in 1989, but I was able to actually go there and see it. Was it difficult to uh, gain entry as, as a U.S. Uh, military personnel? Uh, to East Berlin, was there any higher scrutiny on you rather than being just a regular tourist? Uh, there absolutely was. You had to wear uh, military uniform. Uh, you had to get a special pass. I actually still have the pass. It's written uh, in English, French, German, and Russian, and you had to have that with you at all times. So when we went through the checkpoints, there, I think they over-scrutinized uh, us, uh, sure. actually. But it, it was kind of scary because these... This was our fault. This, these are the people that we are training to fight and we're anticipating fighting. I mean, we, we actually were stationed along the Czechoslovakian border and we're expecting the, the Russians to come over at any time. That, well, that was the way of life for us. And also, you were in a, a different world than you grew up with. You didn't see armed guards roaming the streets and, and I'm sure having these different checkpoints where you had to show papers to show who you were to... Uh, a military person or a police officer to say, I'm here illegally, I'm, I can go down this street. It, it's exactly that way. With um, their police and soldiers were walking around milling through the cities carrying heavy automatic rifles. That's something you don't see in a, in a Western culture. Right. Um, we actually went to where the uh, East German, um, I want to say they're, they're, they're border guards, but when they marched, they would actually, they used the old, what you would see in uh, some of the Nazi movies, the, the goose-stepping march. Very intricate, very interesting to see, but it was a show of power right. as well. Now, when you were on the base, w w did you uh, eat the food of the, of the host country, or was it you were a self-sufficient entity where food was flown in from the U.S., and you had your own cooks there that prepared your standard American meals? Uh, well, we did have our, our dining halls, uh, dining facilities, chow halls, and that was very, everything there was Americanized. If you were on an American base, it was pretty much the same as being back home. Yeah, okay. Uh, there were some quirks because, of course, uh, the, the streets were cobblestone. Um, the buildings were different for the most part. I love German food, so I pretty much ate on what we call eating on the economy, just go outside and and that's where you're going to you meet people, meet friends, spread Americanism, so sure. to speak. Uh, it was fantastic. I still talk to some of the people that I met, the Germans that I met um, that's during great. that time frame. And so when, you, when you, your tour of duty was up in Germany, you spent four years there, where did you go from, from there? I came back to the States, and because I had picked up some German and was familiar with uh, the, the Army way of life, so to speak, I joined uh, a unit here in Connecticut, uh, Army Reserve Unit, and I was a military intelligence specialist. So, so you went from the, the Air Force to the Army. How, how did that work? Did you just fill out some paperwork and have to be resworn in, or uh, well, you did they try to say, no, don't go, stay here with us, uh, we, want, we don't want you to leave? Uh, well, you, you do get resworn in um, every time you re-enlist, and um, it, it was a, a good experience as well. It was extra training. It was something that I was interested in at the time. I was trying to take some college classes while, right. while I was uh, in this unit. And, but th that was a part-time, uh, and I was there for about a year. And our, our economy just wasn't that great, and I was missing full-time active duty. So uh, a friend of mine told me that they were looking for active duty uh, security police over at the uh, guard base in East Granby. And I applied for that. 
got the position and re-enlisted in the Connecticut Air National Guard, okay. but as an active duty member. So my time with the Army Reserve was relatively brief. Sure. Um, and then I stayed at Bradley for almost 20 years. Active duty, about 10 of that. Okay. And then and as, I, as I became a police officer you're familiar with, I, I stayed in the uh, part-time side, traditional guardsman. Sure. And one of the things that happened after 9-11, many of the, the they would say part-time guardsmen were called up to full-time uh, active duty status because of the situation that our country was involved in. And you were one of those that mm -hmm. were called up. Could you describe what happened um, on 9-11? Did you get a phone call the next day uh, alerting you saying, hey, be prepared, or, or the next time you went into drill, they said, we're activating your unit. Um, this is what's going to happen. Ex explain to me what happened there. Well, Kevin, that, that's exactly what happened. You, you, you nailed that on the head. I was actually uh, working a, a private duty job as a police officer in Canton when the attacks occurred. And like everybody else, just in a, a state of shock, just stunned. But knowing what the fallout was going to be, I anticipated a call from my unit right away. Sure enough, I got the call, and they said, um, we don't know what's going on. We're calling everybody in, anticipate being called to uh, active duty to guard the base. And uh, within, I think that week, I was brought on active duty under um, Operation Enduring Freedom, which is right. uh, the Homeland Defense sure. application of, of where we ended up uh, in all this, these years of war now. So my function was to guard, we had A-10s at the base, uh, obviously a, a war asset that were utilized. And um, we just provided security to the entire base, the personnel. We didn't know if we had uh, any of the smaller bases were going to get hit. There right. were rumors that uh, there were terrorist activity on many bases in the United States. And um, from there, we started finding out what operations were occurring worldwide. And I actually was called to go to the Middle East under Noble Eagle. So there's two different operations that I was involved in. So Mark, you arrived at the United Arab Emirates soon after 9-11, and, and our country was in turmoil, as was the globe, with all the outpouring of support that the country sent to, the, uh, to President Bush and, and, uh, and our leaders. And I can only imagine what it must have been like as more aircraft carriers were bringing U.S. troops to uh, the island where you were. What, what did the locals uh, either feel or, or fear or say to, if you had any inkling of that, or you, did, you guys were so secluded because of what recently happened you didn't interact with them? Well, most of the, the local population that I interacted with were uh, members of the United Arab Emirates military. And there, there seemed to be a little tension, but there was not no outright hostility. Um, we, were, uh, very, we were isolated, as I said, we are uh, quite a ways out in the desert. And there were strict controls placed on people coming and going. So I didn't really talk to too many folks. But when I did get a chance to go out on a day of leave into Dubai, quite amazing. Uh, a modern city, as modern uh, as any city you'll find in the United States or any Western civilized country. Um, the goods you can get there, it was just amazing. They had shopping malls that would put some of ours to shame. It's an extremely rich country. And off camera, you shared with me you thought that there might have been a Taliban uh, training camp. Oh, that's correct. Um, Supposedly, the, the rumor was that there was a, an al-Qaeda training camp about 17 miles away from our base. But they were told, this is everything was ramping up now, they were told by the UAE government that they were not to interfere with anything we had going on. I don't know if that's 100% correct. That's what we were briefed on, and that's how we just kept that uh, in the back of our mind as we did our patrolling, that the enemy could very well be right in our backyard. Sure. So how many total years did you serve in the, in the United States Armed Forces? 28 years. So you know, Almost 29. After 28 years, I'm glad to see that you came through unscathed and you were one of the lucky ones that uh, you're able to fulfill your duties that you wanted to do and you come back really unharmed. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there's um, things that you've seen or, or have heard since then are very difficult, but thank you for your service to the country. And, and I often, as a closing, uh, I always allow my guest to uh, send a message to those that are currently serving 
in our military or have recently wrapped up their service. If, and if there's any message that you'd like to deliver to them, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that now. Uh, sure. Of course, I thank you for your service. Uh, my, my brother's in the Navy right now. He's uh, on the Nimitz, and my brother-in-law's in the Army. And my nephew's about to go to a military academy, so uh, it's in my blood. Uh, I, I enjoyed, enjoyed my time in it. I, I think it's a fantastic opportunity, so my message is seize whatever opportunities you can get in the military, all the training you can get. Um, there are, are opportunities to have the military pay for your college, use those to your advantage, get as much college as you can, because when you get out, you're going to need to do something else. Mm. So, Well, thank you to you and to your, your brothers and your, your nephews, and uh, I'm glad the pennies are there to, to protect us. And, and uh, I look forward to uh, my time spent with Mark today, and I'll see you next month on Senator Wickos' Veterans Corner. Good night.